Um, so we're going to talk of what we have about the, the concept of uh, of suffering and pain in the, in the Zohar or in the, in a Kabbalah literature. Um, we have to see it though in in uh, perspective of how suffering is uh, in general perceived in Judaism very briefly, and then go a little bit into Kabbalah and see if there's something different there. The um, the uh, in the in the biblical literature, up until a certain period at least, it seems very clearly that the uh, um, the worldview is that of uh, everything is divine uh, under divine providence and retribution. So one is rewarded for his actions and punished for his sins. So everything good that happens comes as a result of a good deed, and everything bad that happens comes as a result of a of an evil action, uh, and that is that is prevalent throughout the Tanakh. I mean, throughout the Torah. In the Torah, it's very clear. Uh, the Torah says, if you follow the mitzvot, this is what's going to happen. If you don't follow the mitzvot, this is what's going to happen. There's no uh, um, there's no other way around it. It's very very sort of black and white. The uh, but the more you advance, and this is really very briefly, but the more you advance through biblical literature chronologically, the concept of uh, miraculous miraculous uh, government or the miraculous uh, providence that God is watching and, and paying uh, either you know the reward or punishment in, a, in an appropriate way, is uh, slowly fading, fading away. Uh, people ask, I mean, we find from King David on already uh, the questions, why have you done this to me? Why have you abandoned me? Um, in, uh, in, I mean, David is able to, in Tehillim, to, uh, to overcome his, uh, his anguish and all the difficulties that he went through, but there is one, uh, there is one, uh, psalm, which is very powerful in that in that context of uh, of suffering, and that is uh, Psalm eighty eight, which is sort of the not not the middle, but uh, pretty much close to the center of Tehillim. And one second, let me pull it up. So. Psalm 88 starts like that. Lamnatzeh al mahalat le'anot maski le'eman ha'ezrahi for the leader upon mahalat le'anot. It could be uh, musical instruments, but the names are symbolic. Mahala uh, means disease. Le'anot means to be tortured. Uh, and he says, and you read this, he, he says, God of my salvation, what time I cry in the night before you, listen to me, heed my uh, my prayers, uh, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I have become as a man who has no help. Um, and you know, in verse eight, it says, "Your wrath lies hard upon me, and all your waves you have pressed down. You have put my acquaintances far from me. I am shut up, and I cannot come forth." So this is a description of someone who's really uh, he feels um, uh, captured or besieged by. By his uh, by his ailment, by his disease, in verse sixteen it says, "I am afflicted at the point of death. From my youth up, I have borne your terrors. I am distracted. Um, I don't know if the translation distracted is correct. I I would translate Nasati Amecha Afuna is wherever I turn, I I face your terrors. They came round about me like water all day. They com- they compassed me about together, friend and companion." You have put it far away from me, my acquaintances into darkness. In the Hebrew, it's more powerful. It's my acquaintances, darkness. There's no no there's no proposition even. It's as if and it ends on the word darkness. It's a very dark uh, dark uh, psalm. What, who's friend here? David's friends. So he, he doesn't say specifically who who is he. Uh, we know that David in, throughout his life. Uh, had to uh, endure many betrayals. First of his family, his parents, his siblings, uh, then of King Saul, 
Then, <coughs> when he was running away from him, wherever he was hiding, people came and told Saul where David is hiding. Then his own sons, Amnon, Avshalom, Adonia. So he, he, he endured a lot from the people around him. And uh, and through, the, through Psalms, he, he goes through, these, though, through the vicissitudes of his life, where sometimes it is at a high point and praises God and singing. And that's also how he ends the Elim. But in the middle, you'll find all these Mizmorim. So I think in terms of the literature, that one could relate to um, many, but the most powerful texts are found uh, in Tehillim. And then, of course, there's the uh, the book of Job, that is the uh, the classic story of of uh, suffering, or it's like senseless suffering, and uh, in in a sense presents the the question of theodicy of why do uh, the righteous suffer, or why do innocent people suffer, uh, babies, uh, mess, uh, catastrophes, natural disasters, people who are born with certain ailments that they cannot, uh, what have they done wrong? And then this is the, the period where people start uh, realizing that maybe the system of the Torah doesn't work. I mean, to say today, in the Orthodox world, is tantamount to heresy, uh, because the Rambam included it in the principles of faith that God pays. You know, there is reward and punishment. The question is, what is the reward and punishment? The reward and punishment in the early biblical system was a miraculous one. No, Whereas, it's not. sorry, Rambam said what principles of faith? It, it, what he says that the one of the principles is that we believe that God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. Yet, when you look around you, you don't see it. And um, already the time of Maimonides, the the whole department of uh, salary and retribution was moved to the upper floor or you know behind closed doors, and nobody ever comes back to say whether they were paid or not. So basically, we have to believe in that. But it is when you really dig into it, you realize that as much as it helps us to believe that there is reward and retribution in the world to come, it could also be detrimental because um, it could cause the, the believing person who wants to do the right thing to become selfish because now his whole work or uh, toil in, in doing the right thing is not in order to make the world a better place or to do it because it's the right thing to do, but rather because it's uh, what will guarantee him a good spot in the world to come. Um, but even in, even before we get there, when we look at the biblical literature, there's a concept of if you do good, it will guarantee you a good spot in this world. You will live good in this world. And and this is where Job comes into the picture uh, Job seems to be a perfect person, but, and again, this is very briefly, you could spend a whole semester just, you know, going over the book of Job, but what I'm telling you now, this is uh, something that I started developing as a, as a as an understanding of Job after 9-11. I lived in Brooklyn at the time. I actually moved to Brooklyn on September 1st of that year. So, nine days, uh, ten days later, that happens. A lot of my Congregants were working in the area. Uh, most of them uh, came back walking through the Brooklyn Bridge, but the the um, the overall feeling was that of, of of total shock of how can how can humans do it to other humans? How they can do it uh, with deliberate intention and in the name of God? So, and I had to deliver the, the speeches and classes in the synagogue at the time. So it just connected to my own questions on theodicy that I had since childhood, because I faced also, within my family and friends, uh, tragedies that I didn't understand. How can God do this to me, or how can God do this to anyone? So I, I, was, I went looking into the book of Job, and you know maybe it's a, a certain point in life where you get a different insight, and that was my insight. I realized that Eov is in the word of, of Satan, is really doing, he has a contract with God. In verse 10 he says, uh, you, the, Satan tells God, 
Of course he fears you. You made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has and you protect him and you bless him. Of course he will. He loves you. Um, and I, so it seems like Iov, job, I, I'll call him Iov. Iov is uh, doing what he's doing because, I know, out of a selfish uh, intention. We, we can see that if you go back to verse 5, that he's concerned, he says, it may be that my sons have sinned and blasphemed God in their heart. The main concern of Iov throughout the book is that uh, he will curse God. Why would you? Why would anyone fear that? Because this is this is the subconscious, or or, or the hidden thought that he has, and he's afraid of the Freudian slip of letting it out, and he doesn't want to let it out because God is greater, God is more powerful, and God can smite him. So he does whatever God tells him to do. Um, <clears throat> and I think the whole point of the story, which obviously is fiction and not never happened, um, and it was written, uh, I have, we have the textual proof for that, that Iov was written by uh, the prophet Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, the language, certain, certain uh, uh, motifs in, in the story, in the uh, text, there are a lot of uh, things that point that Iov was written by Yirmiyahu, and it's very probable that Yirmiyahu wrote that after the destruction. He answers the people who say, why did God destroy the temple? So, a partial answer would be because we are sinners and we didn't maintain the temple correctly. But the question is about all the innocent people who were swept in the wake of that disaster because the blame was always put throughout the the book of the prophets on the leaders, on the spiritual leaders, the political leaders. But why were everyone suffering. So, Yirmiyahu is trying to address that. So, Yirmiyahu says, here we have a person, Iov, who's focused on his own life and tries to strike this deal with God where he says, I'll do whatever you want as long as you leave me alone. And when you read through the book, go back and read the book and you'll see that several places he says, I wish, after he suffers... He says, I wish there would be an arbitrator who would be unbiased, someone who's greater than both of us. Then I would have been able to argue with God. This is when his true intention is exposed, where he says, basically, I do what you want, God, because you're a bully, because you're stronger than me, and you could do whatever you want. So I, I, I must obey. Now, what what is the problem with that? The problem is that with that is that all of... Uh, Eov's actions are self-centered and as a result he doesn't really read the world around him he doesn't read the suffering of others he knows that he must help the poor and the needy and the widow and the orphan but if it was up to him he would not have done that he just does this because it's written in the book and if he doesn't do it he's going to be punished so he doesn't foster a an environment of spiritual growth and care for each other, and the world around him does not change. That's why, when you look before that, in, in verse 5, Iov calls his sons and brings a sacrifice for them. Maybe they have cursed God. Meaning, they are not, they are unchanged by him. He's, he's performing an external ritual to clear them of guilt. So what happens after... Uh, Iov is afflicted the uh, so Iov tears his clothes and says I, naked I came out of my mother's womb and naked I shall return there famous phrase it is said in some practices at the funeral and that definitely the next phrase is said God gave and God has taken away may the name of God be blessed and it says yet he did not sin and he did not uh, turn against God. Um, but then he himself is afflicted with boils, with the disease over, over his skin. And at that point, in Eov is really reduced to, uh, you know, almost he loses his humanity. And his wife says, you still hold fast to your integrity, curse God, and you'll die. Or in other words, she says, you have to commit suicide. 
your system doesn't work. Your whole life you believed that if you do good, God will reward you. It doesn't work. And I'm sure you ran into people who were in that situation, people who witnessed tragedies, um, uh, whether, you know, it's a... I remember in my community when I lived in Bogota, there was a plane crash, uh, and on board the plane were more than 100 people. Five of them were from my immediate community. Some, two of them related, and, and it was just a shock to the community. Um, and one very good friend of, of ours, an observant woman, it was difficult to be observant there, told me that her immediate reaction after the after she heard of the accident, of the crash, was to take a piece of non-kosher meat and eat it. Sort of a rebellion. Like, it was, of course, it makes no sense. It's out of anger. But to, for her it was, see God, you didn't help me. All that I... Sh- she was able to later on sort of uh, slowly uh, come over, but it was not easy. But that is the immediate reaction. Is The system doesn't work. Why did I work hard all my life to guarantee good life? It doesn't work. So, and his wife, we see, is not was not affected by him. They live together for who knows how long. They have ten children, um, so they must have or seven. Um, so they must have lived, you know, been married for twenty years, twenty five years, um, or even more. And with all that, she was never influenced by him. For him, for her, his system doesn't work. And he says, "You speak as an impious woman." The the impious women, and he refuses to listen to her. And he says, Bechorzot, lo hata yov With all that, he has not sinned with his lips. Meaning that in his heart, he did. Already he's shaken. Already in heart, he believes that the system doesn't work. His, now his friends come over to visit him. And uh, they are shocked to see him in that situation. And then after that, Yov opens his mouth and curses his day. <coughs> He said, let the day perish wherein I was born, the night wherein it was said a child is brought forth. Let that day be darkness, let God not inquire after it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. So what, is, what does it mean when he curses the day? So one could say, maybe he uses it as a euphemism for God. But no, he says, let God curse the day. So I think that the answer here is in verse 6, he says, let that night not be counted in the number of the months or the days of the year. Meaning, I think that he believes in destiny or cosmology. He was born, uh, he was born under the, uh, the sign of, uh, of a certain, uh, or not cosmology, sorry, astrology. He was born under the sign of a certain a planet or a certain uh, heavenly body, and therefore his day is cursed. No matter how much good he will do, he will be punished, he will suffer because of the specific day in which he was born. Meaning he sees no other reason for his suffering other than the uh, supernatural forces that move the world. So the solution is for that day uh, to disappear. Then he would not have suffered. And then he goes on to say, that, "No matter what, what, what about his suffering?" No, I mean that that no matter how many good deeds he does, he will eventually suffer because the day he was born was predestined for disaster. And then in verse eleven and twelve, he says, "Why was I born at all? Why did I not perish at birth?" In other words, he agrees with his wife. His wife says, "The system doesn't work. Take the first exit out of this world." And do it by cursing God. He says, I cannot do it. I'm not allowed to do it. But I wish that I had never been born at all. Because life in this world suck. I mean, it, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Uh, so he, he gives his uh, speeches and his presentation. And then his friend starts talking to him. And once you listen to his friends you realize that it's your one could be very fortunate to have friends, but sometimes with friends like that, who needs, you know, uh, enemies? And that, by the way, is a very common thing that I've heard 
people saying in Shiva, in, in other occasions, when trying to comfort someone, they basically tell him that he must have done something wrong to deserve it. And that's what Eov's friends tell him. They tell him, oh, you have, comfor- you have, you have comforted many, you have ho- helped many, but now that it happens to you, you buckle down, you don't know what to say. And look at verse 7, Eliphaz says, Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright cut off? In other words, you're a sinner, and you just don't know it. And you deserve to suffer. And then the book goes on and on and on for 30 chapters, a dialogue or a quadrologue between Eov and uh, his three friends. And the the author keeps emphasizing that Eov has three friends. Then, in chapter... One second. In chapter 32, we read this. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. And you can't argue with him because he believes that, that he's, he's righteous. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barachel, the Buzite of the family of Ram. Why was he angry? Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. So he says, either way, I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you, Eov's friends, who say that Eov is a criminal or a sinner, and I don't agree with you, Eov, that you think you're you're the perfect person. Um, and I also believe that the, the it appears in this chapter thirty-two, and then there are like three chapters of introduction before Elihu provides his answer, because this is really a theological bomb, and Irmiyahu doesn't want to drop it on people so simply. He hides it under layers of discussion and repetitive statements. Um, but I really think that is, if you, when you clear everything, that you, you could see right through it. Um, the name of Elihu is symbolic. Elihu means, he is my God. Whereas Berechel is, I will bless God. So it's the opposite of Iov, who rejects God, and who's afraid of, of, uh, of cursing God. He's also called the Buzite, which the word Buz in Hebrew means disgrace or shame. So he says, the author says, I'm going to present to you an opinion which will not be accepted easily. It's going to be shunned and, and, and rejected. But it is Mishpahat Ram. It comes from a noble family, meaning... It has a noble, a noble origin, but people are not willing to accept it. And by the way, here is a place where the name of Yirmiyahu is uh, is alluded to, because Yirmiyahu, we have the Resh and the Mem are really the the root of the word. It means elevated, and the other letters Yud Yud Hey Vav are part of God's name and and vowels. So, what is it that that uh, Eliphaz says? So, chapter thirty two. If you want to sum it in in one phrase, it says, I'm going to speak. The whole chapter, 22 verses. I'm going to speak, because I need to speak. Then uh, we go to chapter 33. Sorry, chapter 33. Come on. Um, <clears throat> again, it says, there is, there's a reason why I'm talking. There's a vision. I have I had a vision at night. Uh, where I connect to maybe this like some kind of a of a mystical thing, and then again he speaks in chapter thirty four. I'm going to talk and I'm going to tell you what I have to say to you. So three chapters of introduction, and finally chapter thirty five, which is relatively short. Elihu says this: You think that you are right by saying that I'm more righteous, or I'm righteous before God. Uh, and then you ask, what advantage will it be unto me? And what profit shall I have more than if I had sinned? This is exactly the question that believing, observant people ask. What's in it for me? Why should I be observant? And they say, I should be observant because God guarantees me good life. God guarantees me uh, good life either in this world or in the world to come. So Elihu says, 
Habet Shamayim Ore Veshur Shehakim Gavehu Mimeka. Look unto the heavens and see, and behold the skies which are higher than you. Im Hatata Matif Albo Verabu Feshai Hamata Aselo. If you have sinned, what do you do against him? And if your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do unto him? Im Tzadakta Matiten Lo Omamia Dechaika. If you are righteous, what do you give him, or what does he receive of your hand? In other words, Eov says, uh, sorry, Elihu says, God is uh, omnipotent and transcendental, is beyond our grasp, beyond our reach. You think that what you do is going to affect him? I mean, it's interesting to read that when we know that, you know, later on in the Kabbalistic uh, uh, tradition, we will talk about theurgy and how the actions of humans directly impact the, the 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 world of God. Their answer would be, we don't affect the end sof. The end sof is the untouchable, un immutable God, but we are affecting the world of the sefirot, which is the emanation, whatever it is. Okay, but then he he, can, he, he continues. He says, "Leish kamocha rishaycha, ulven adam tzidkatecha." Your wickedness concerns a man as you, and your righteousness a son of man. And I would say that if you want to sum the theology of the Tanakh regarding reward and punishment in one sentence or in six words, that would be it. Leish kamocha rishaycha ulven adam tidkatecha. Your wickedness affects people like you. Your righteousness affects people like you. And it's also extremely interesting. What verse is that? What? Verse 35, 35, 35? Uh, 8. Thank you. Very telling also that the word kamocha takes us to the golden rule. Ve'ahavta le'reacha kamocha. Love the other as you love yourself. On which the rabbi said, Zokola Torah kula. This is the whole Torah. In other words, what Elihu says to Yov, the purpose of the Torah and the belief in God is not to guarantee you a good life, but to guarantee the world a better life. And it's not an absolute. It doesn't mean that you that that if you observe throughout your whole life, you'll be protected. And it doesn't even guarantee that your children or your family or your relatives or your country will be protected. That's why this opinion is not so popular. But what's in it for me? Right? Well, there's a limit to how good I'm willing to be in order to help other people. But... The uh, the message of Elihu is that that when we do the right thing, whether it's an act of kindness or improving our behavior or even a small thing is not uh, driving recklessly or double parking, right? That could eventually, in the long term, like the butterfly effect, uh, make the world a better place. And as a matter of fact, the world has become a better place since the dawn of humanity um, in terms of, of life expect, expectancy and disease and all that. Uh, we don't think that it be, has become that because we read constantly, we hear about violence, but there's a there's a book by um, Steven Pinker called The Better Angels of Our Nature where he shows that uh, by numbers, the the cases of violence per capita per person in the, in the population has been dropping constantly. In any case, this is um, this is what we find in Tanakh. We find the revealed layer where there is a tit for tat, and the hidden layer that I haven't found. Um, I mean, there, in Maimonides, in, in the God of the Perplex, there's a, uh, an allusion to that, but that was tramped by all the uh, all the other literature that uh, decided that it's better to adopt the the approach that uh, suffering is a, uh, is a sign of, uh, of a punishment. And when you see the suffering of the innocent, like a child who's born um, already ill or, or stillbirth, that would be the result of an, a reincarnation, meaning that, that is, this is a soul that has returned to the world and now is paying for what it did in the previous life. So the, a whole system has to be, had to be created in order to explain suffering. So um,
<clears throat> so in other words, what um, what Eliyahu was saying there is that you have to work on Tikkun Olam. You have to make the world a better place. And there is the equation works because the more people, uh, when people refrain from harming each other and from being evil, then more resources are freed to take care of the embitterment of the world. And that was actually documented in the United States at the uh, the year after 9-11, for the first six months, there was a constant drop at the level of crime. It's as if people felt that there was so much evil that we must balance it by introducing some goodness to the world. And they were even including petty thefts and, you know, breaking into, you know, cars and all that. <clears throat> but this is this is the, like I said, the philosophy of the... Um, uh, of the Tanakh, the more the the clearer or the the more revealed layer that we see in Tanakh is that of a retribution, the system of reward and punishment. And the rabbis, when they had to deal with it, with the destruction, with everything that was was they were, were going through, had to say that uh, the reward is in the world to come. But they were afraid of the system becoming selfish. So they warned their students by saying, This is a famous statement of um, of Antignos Ish Socho. It appears in in the Pirkei uh, Avot or the teachings of our of of the uh, yes. Um, before we leave Eov, I just want to mention. Um, that if anybody um, isn't, you know, hasn't taken Rabbi, uh, uh, not Rabbi, Doctor Ziegelboim's Ziegelboim, um, yes. uh, wisdom books class, uh, it's really, really remarkable. And he does. We spend the whole semester on um, Kohelet and Eov, and he has. Um, it's really a brilliant and beautiful um, exegesis. So. Um... So we go in 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 Perkei Avot, the very beginning, uh, the third Mishnah, uh, chapter one, Mishnah uh, Gimel. We read Antignos Ish Socho Aya Omer, Al Tiu Kavadim Am Shamshim Et Arav Al Mad Lekabel Pras, Ela Hevu Kavadim Am Shamshim Et Arav Shelo Al Mad Lekabel Pras. Do not. Sir, Where are you? Here. Uh, you see it? Can you... What's the English? Oh. Uh, where is this coming from? I'm, I'm translating. I, I don't have the English here. I'm no, just... I mean, Mishnah what? Oh, Mishnah Avot, the teachings of the fathers, 1, 3. Chapter 1, Mishnah 3. Thank you. And the, and he says, do, when you serve God, don't serve Him in order to, to be rewarded, but serve Him in order not to be rewarded. But we all know very well that this doesn't work. I mean, when you when you are being told that there is a reward at the end of the journey, and I say, don't think of the reward, think of the journey. We know, right? We know what happens, and and this is the way uh, most of the religious world uh, is is brought up today, whether Jewish or non-Jewish. There's a very strong emphasis on the world to come and on the reward, because people don't see how they are rewarded here. And that is something that has to be changed. We have to feel rewarded by, uh, by, by, the, uh, by the process itself, that I feel a better person by being observant, and I can make the world a better pla- a place, and therefore that gives me a sense of purpose, and, and, and eventually influences other people. So I'm allowed to be a little selfish, but not for me, but rather to share that... Um, uh, ability to do things, to share it with the world, to share it with others. So Judaism originally was this kind of is the inner energy that flows out outward towards the world. But you know we've we've been became reclusive uh, because it's easier to think of ourselves. And when I say that it's in Christianity, también, that's why uh, also I spent Spanish in Christianity. Also, it's that um, you know John Lennon. 
says, uh, imagine there's no heaven, right? He, he says it not as an atheist, I think he says it as a believer, he says, don't direct all your efforts to heaven and hell, but rather to the people around you, the people like you. Okay, now, uh, after that, like what we see in the Bible, the, in rabbinic literature, there's a um, there's a, uh, a broad literature on the concept of Yisurim, on the concept of suffering, and in that literature, it is 100% uh, the the suffering is seen, is is perceived as a punishment for a sin, um, and and that is you know so anyone who's suffering is considered they people would come and visit him and say, uh, search your actions, search your thought. You must have done something wrong, and then they would sit together and go through his actions and thoughts, and then they would fi- find something and fix it and hope for uh, for the better. And I still see the same thing today. People call me. Uh, and they say, I want to check my, my mezuzot. Where does it say that? What? Uh, anyone who is suffering has done something wrong. Oh. So I know. Um, where is it written? Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> they, they uh, I mean, people call me today to, to check their mezuzot. Because they've heard that if your mezuzah is uh is not kosher then something will happen um and at one case i had there was a, a couple who didn't get along and they and the they asked me to the wife asked me to add, to check the mezuzot and i said i didn't find anything wrong she says check again check again um i think maybe at one point i had to say okay maybe i think this one is not so good oh great so now uh now we have the solution but of course this is not the solution uh, but um, there's also an added element there, and that is the uh, encounter with Christianity, where in Christianity, uh, martyrdom and dying for God became uh, was a central concept, and the crucifixion itself was a torturous uh, process. It was uh, it was horrible. So, uh, in a way, uh, suffering at that point has become uh, sort of an elevated. Uh, experience and the rabbis coined the term Yisurim Shel Ahava uh, suffering that's come out of love and in that sense the the, the righteous person would suffer as uh, as a sacrifice for the generation God loves him and therefore God chooses him either either takes him from the world before his time or brings suffering upon him for him to expiate on the sins of the generation, which is a, you think of it, is a very Christian idea. It's not was not originally found uh, in Tanakh. I mean, after the the after Christianity started floating that idea, people went, went back to Tanakh and found uh, maybe sources that, on, on which that can rely. But it is not biblical uh, theology. But that has become the theology in rabbinic time. Yes. What's the Hebrew? Yisurim shel ahava. Thank you. Um, there, there is an uh, there's an image that could have been. Now, when we get a little bit into Kabbalah, that uh, maybe came from the Safrut Echalot from the Yodei Merkava literature, and that is that there's a there's a spiritual altar in heaven upon which Michael, who is the a guardian angel of Israel sacrifices the souls of the righteous. They become the sacrifice which serves God. So um, we have we have that in in uh, in uh, rabbinic period, and I, like I said, it's still it, it's still something that uh, people believe in. Um, but I'll go one second here to one one entry from the Zohar. I know that. You have the Zohar in English, so if you want, you can look it up. It's it's the actually. So here the Zohar in in uh, in the book of Bereshit in page thirty eight, uh, side B, it speaks about the the palaces uh, in which the uh, the souls of the righteous uh, rejoice in the world to come. Uh, and here is like first the first paragraph you see here is Echala Kadma'a, that's the first palace. 
And here, this paragraph speaks about Hechala Tinyana. I'll read and translate. Hechala Tinyana. Hechala Dakaima Lego Mea Yechala Kadma'a. There's a second palace, which is uh, further in of the first palace. So in in the uh, uh, in that in that setting of the Zohar, the first is the outmost. So you go uh, inwards into a higher level. So this one is close to the uh, to the cave of the fathers of the forefathers. This this hechal, this palace shines more than the first one. Nahir Because here we have all the precious stones that surround this uh, palace. Begod within this palace, it nehiru had. Kalil Mikol Gavnin, there's one light which combines all other lights. And uh, remember that we said this this uh, idea of the light that combines all light shows the inner uh, the inner existence or the inner entity because it contains everything. And it shines from above downwards. So it's almost like the uh, the idea of the, the light that comes from Chokhmah and Bina, as all the lights are there, but they only see they are only uh, perceive when they come to the lower, uh, to the lower part. So, the and the, and the image here, if we speak about the, this light, it means that uh, there, there is a very, uh, it's an elevated level where there is a connection between the Arichantin, the upper sefirot, and the seven lower sefirot. And who is in this palace? Beha Echala, and and that in this palace. Kaimin inun de savlu yisurin umerain bari alma, those who have suffered, uh, who have, were afflicted with suffering and diseases in this world, begin leitakana in order to accomplish themselves. So they see that as a a way to in in Kabbalah, whereas in uh, um, in uh, in rabbinic literature, the purification was a purification from sin and from guilt. In Kabbalah, we you could say that I don't want to say where, where I mean where exactly the source is, but there is the idea of the the original sin of what is called the zuhamat anahash, the the poison of the um, the mythical serpent of the Garden of of Eden who defiled Hava, and I mean this is a metaphor to. Uh, uh, to a certain impurity that clings to human beings by the mere fact that they live in this world, meaning the Kabbalah took now this existence to the uh, our existence is we must come to this world, the neshama must come down to this world against its will, and when it comes down, it 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 is it is soiled with with the existence with the impure existence around it. So the Yisurim, the suffering, are perceived now as a, as a means to cleanse the body and, I mean, and cleanse the soul. <clears throat> and um, that is not surprising also that comes on the, on the backdrop of asceticism. Like I mentioned, Rabbi Avram ben Arambam, uh, Rabbi Avram, the son of Maimonides, in his Kafay al-Abadin, that which is sufficient for the servant of God, uh, he is really uh, very fond of the life of the fakirs and, and the darwishes who live uh, an ascetic life. Because that, but that, that is the, the, from the point of view of philosophy, from the point of view of Kabbalah, is that the more you withdraw from the pleasures of this world and even afflict your body, the more you, uh, you get rid of that burden of the body and then you connect your soul to, uh, to a higher... Uh, to higher existence. Later on, you will find, uh, you know, when we speak about the holy Havurot, remember that we spoke about the people of Tzafat, um, would fast. There was, uh, even even in our generation, uh, my my grandfather told me of a disciple of his great-grand, of his father, that did something, not that, not that his, his father approved of it, 
but that uh, man, that rabbi, would fast every day from uh, and and would only drink water, and uh, he would really afflict himself in, in a terrible way. Um, actually, I heard from his from the son of that rabbi that when he would say the kiddush on Friday night and drink a little wine, he would scream in pain because the because his digestive system was shrinking. He was not when I couldn't. Uh, Except the uh, the the sugar or the wine, so that is that is taking it to an extreme. But the idea is that that it's a tikkun, it's some kind of a purification. Just the, the what has to be purified has changed. Whereas the uh, in the rabbinical period it was the uh, uh, either the sin of the righteous person or the sin of the generation in the Kabbalah. It is now taking into the realm of. Uh, there's a pagam ba'olamot. There's a there's a crisis in the world. The world itself is is a there's a uh, a presence of the forces of evil, and we have to clear them by our affliction. So those people are there. What do they do in the uh, sorry? What do they do when they were in, alive? Havo modan um shabhan lemarihon kol yoma vela havo mevatelin tzelotayho lealmin. They would praise and thank their master, God, every day, and they would never, never uh, stop praying. So this this is a, a vision that we see in Kabbalah that's a little different, That, but it is a, I would say, a development <coughs> of the idea of Yisurim of, uh of suffering that one takes upon himself out of love, meaning that it's the love of God, and, he, and, and that person helps God in running the world, and so the world has to get rid of evil, and the righteous person does that by uh, by suffering through his suffering. You know, it's a little uh, reminiscent of what we spoke yesterday about the uh, the Kabbalah as being, you know, elitist or or for the public. So that that is another example where the the righteous person or the Kabbalists say. I could take upon myself things that not not only the the spiritual experience, but also the, in the physical realm, where this can um, this can uh, uh, help the rest of the world. There is a way. I mean, like I thought that I mentioned before, that causing pain to oneself, in a way, causes some kind of a of a, of a spiritual experience. It's it forces the the brain either to focus in a certain way, or there are certain chemical reactions in the body that respond in a certain way. So, in medieval times, that was a prevalent uh, practice within the uh, the Christian world, and could be that there was also, you know, in a way, uh, affected uh, Kabbalah. But then, after all that, we do have, I think, something that we could relate to when, when the uh, when the, when the Zohar says that there were those people who, through their suffering, still praise and. Uh, and and pray to God, I I think that what we see here is the suggestion that the spiritual experience or the engagement in the spiritual spiritual experience could help someone overcome pain. So we know that that uh, belief and prayers and being part of a religious community could help people become emotional pain. That we have they have the support system or they have the 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 feeling that they could rely on God or some divine power to help them. But we'll see that there is also a, a possibility that it could help overcome physical pain. So, but let's take a break now, and, and after the break we'll continue. So, when we, when we speak about the uh, how is Kabbalah really... Uh, a tool that can help people overcome physical physical pain. So, what came to my mind? I mean, looking at this uh, those statement in the Zohar of the people who are singing and praising God despite their illness or their suffering. What came to my mind is a famous story about the Rebbe of Mojitz. There's a there's a Hasidic court called Mojitz. Um, I'm not sure how it would be spelled in English. So, Mojitz, you see, it was a, was a Hasidic uh, was a Hasidic uh, uh, 
is still a uh, Hasidic court. It is famous for its music. Nigunei Mojitz, uh, one of the rabbis, uh, composed over 4,000, uh, uh, I mean, over the rabbis together created more 4,000 4, uh, uh, tunes. And the, uh, the, but the most famous of them is the one called Ezkera. Um, Ezkera is a prayer that is uh, uh, is recited on Yom Kippur, Ezkera Elokim Ve'emaya. Here, you know, you have the, the link, I could send it to you later, uh, but you could find also, on, I, I believe, in Wikipedia when you look at the Mojiz Rabbis. So, what is the story of this, uh, of this uh, uh, piyut, according to one tradition, is that the, uh, the Rabbi had to uh, undergo a uh, a medical procedure, and and while he was undergoing this procedure, he was he was chanting that piyut, and he felt no pain throughout the operation. He was able to just sustain himself with the music. Uh, I mean, there's there and there are more, I think, incidents like that when you uh, your people are in a state of meditation. And cannot feel pain, and sometimes I think it even happens to, um, you know, we when when you're really fully engaged in something, uh, you wouldn't feel. I mean, not not extreme pain, but uh, minor things will go unnoticed. So, uh, and that is where I think there is some kind of a, the ben- the great benefit of Kabbalah meditation, you know, being able to overcome physical pain. That has to do with um, with things that that have been discovered recently is not just about distracting yourself from it but rather it's really uh, rewiring your brain um, recently the field of neuroplasticity is a uh, is a developing uh, uh, developing very very quickly but I mean up until 20 years ago uh, people believe that the, 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 the brain is a, a sort of rigid uh, uh, organ it is created a certain way and remains like that once once it 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 uh, reaches uh, maturity, it never changes. It does not regenerate, or uh, etc. Um, then recently, there were a couple, the many many uh, researches done on the subject, and one great uh, one author, Norman Doidge, uh, wrote two very important books. The first one is called "The Mind That Changes Itself." Uh, basically, it's the flexible brain, and uh, the second one is called the brain's way of healing, and in the brain's way of healing, one one chapter is dedicated to pain management, where he speaks about um, you know the the the, uh, the problem that we have today that uh, you know in in situation of acute or chronic pain that is controlled by by medicine. The body, at a certain point, relies on the medicine and cannot and cannot fight back pain. But there, uh, and there are situations where uh, severe pain, because of back injury or something like that, develops into a an acute chronic pain. And when the research was done on that in the, in in recent years with our ability to better understand the mind and how it works what was what was discovered was that each area in our brain in our brain is i mean this i'm i'm talking that i'm seeing saying that as a layman and i recommend reading the book but um but it, i found it very uh very interesting to the level that i can understand that, that in a simplified manner every area of our, in our brain is in charge of a different activity i mean there are designated areas in our brain of sight vision memory etc but and but every but our brain is flexible so our brain could perform other tasks as well so the 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 area that that handles sight could handle sight and pain uh audio and pain smell and pain memory and pain etc now when there is acute pain the pain takes over it sort of conquers that part of the brain and forces it to dedicate all of its efforts as much as possible to uh, to think or to feel uh, the pain because it has to um, 
to take care of itself. The body has to take care of and and, and heal the situation. Um, <clears throat> so the solution that uh, that is offered, I mean, if it's, it's a very, it's not a, it's not a simple solution. It takes a lot of effort and and self training and self control. And ironically, it was it was developed by a a scholar whose field was uh, pain management, but also was very adventurous in himself. Uh, he went into like once a year would go into a you know uh, sort of a, a junkyard to try to do all kind of silly thing. He climbed on a tank and and broke his back or something like that. Terrible manner. So that brought him to to focus on that, and he found out that if you uh, if one can uh, reappropriate those parts of the brain that are meant to handle certain uh, activities and force them to handle that, then they cannot handle pain. They are not free to handle pain, then the sensation of pain is lessened. So this, I think, is uh, um, where you could find maybe a correlation between this and what the Rebbe of Mojitz did, or maybe other Kabbalists were able to do, and that is that uh, in a heightened state of awareness, they are able to uh, to reach uh, into their brain, or or maybe to uh, to control their brain in a more compartmentalized manner, and make sure that these parts of the brain are now dedicated either to their spiritual ascent or or uh, to learning or to anything like that. So I think that is where you have the correlation. So it would be not in the theory of Kabbalah, because the, the theoretical Kabbalah is pretty much an um, an enhancement of rabbinical thought, and sometimes a synthesis of the rabbinical thought and the rabbinical thought. So they would speak about Yisurim sufferings as a result of um, of uh, one's sins or one's actions. We had this the this section of the Zohar that sees it as an an active act of purification of the world. So, but this is just a theological um, words of comfort to tell the people who are suffering, don't think that you're suffering in vain because really what you're doing now, you're helping God in bringing the world uh, to its perfect place, to the the utopian existence. But on the practical level, that could could have been a solution that uh, maybe was practiced by by the Kabbalists, so maybe when, even when they were, uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, it's a speculation, it could be that what for many of them was, uh, was seen by others as asceticism, for them was actually part of their exercise to see how far they could push the body and let the mind, let the mind take over without feeling uh, those conditions. So I think that is uh, one way, uh, one way to look at it. Um well, and then this pretty much we could look for I could look for more sources on on this subject and uh if I find something which is significant in that particular field I will refer there uh, I'll refer you to that uh but I you, Jews, so you can um you can do that email it back to me Yes I will um I will so let's sort of uh, summarize the uh um the journey that we we took on that course of of uh, introduction to mysticism, and then uh, and then your questions. So, what we did basically, we went uh, historically. We didn't get to the end of the line because we stopped at the fifteenth, sixteenth century. After that, there is the development. I mean, we we taught we we touched on that briefly, but uh, following the time of the Ari and and Rabbi Yosef Karo, the uh, the ideas of Kabbalah had a major influence of the halachic practice uh, of the daily practice, um, and that was also part of the uh, the process of the rise of Shabbat Tzvi and Hasidut, and um, in modern times the Kabbalah center. But what we did, we went so methodically from a uh, biblical period where there are. Uh, illusions or rare hints to the uh, to the mystical experience as it as it stems from like from the uh, the efforts of a person 
But those were, even even in a mystic's life, they were isolated the moment. We don't find stories of the people who lived as mystics throughout their life. Then in rabbinic period, it becomes more uh, more evident, there's more discussion of that. Uh, there are people who are, we call Yodei Merkava, that are engaged in this kind of ecstatic or mystical activity. But they're uh, not, they are not necessarily working on ideas of theology, of understanding the divinity, and so on. That evolves later at the time of the the late the the end of the period of the Geonim, the ninth century, and on into the uh, golden age in Spain during the time of uh, Rabbi Bahaye and Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, where they philosophically um, explore the ideas of of the divinity and of God, but then. The, the counteraction to that is the uh, the creation of the circle of, of Kabbalists in Provence and in Spain who take elements from Safut uh, Echalot and Sefer Yetzira, which uh, it is not clear that it could be described as a mystical book, to be, it could be esoteric, but not mystical in the sense that we understand Kabbalah, but they, they took elements from Sefer Yetzira from Sefer Abahir, that probably composed in Provence at the time, and laid the foundations for the later revelation of the Book of the Zohar, and the Book of the Zohar really caused a revolution in the mystical tradition, took over, um, and it became the the cornerstone upon which commentaries were written, uh, schools were built, and we could say that the uh, one of the 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 Renaissance period of the Zohar, there's an equivalent, was in the 15th and 16th century in Tzafat, under the Arizal and um, and his circle. So we got to that point historically, and in the analysis of the Zohar, we went through the main concepts, just beginning to touch the main concepts of the Ensof, the Keter, the world of Sefirot, and the connection between this uh, world of Sefirot and our world. And eventually we concluded with the discussion of what 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 is the practical application of Kabbalah in everyday life and how uh how much the, the Kabbalists are engaged with uh with laymen or with the with the broader community. And there I I said that there are different there are different uh manifestations of that and I personally believe that it has to really to do with the personality of the Kabbalist or the scholar, that this study just uh, enhances and heightens the character traits that are already inherent in that person, unless we have a situation where that person wants to really um, invest in changing um, certain negative quality traits or be more engaged with the community. Other than that, it usually, you know, you the, the, it will split along the lines of one's personality, but more often than uh, and none, the 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 people who engage in Kabbalah and are also observant, and when they do it sincerely, tend to be more sensitive and more, uh, uh, I would say, they are people who have this kind of positive energy. But the ultimate test is is with you when you talk to someone like that, is that you have to feel it, you have to feel that. Uh, you are talking to someone who may who is uh, not just not just a scholar, but someone who is who has been transformed by the knowledge that he or or she uh, possesses. So I think that is a uh, I could sum it up uh, up to now with these words. And as we always feel when 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 we read those words of Kabbalah, it's yadian velo yadian. It's known and unknown. It's revealed and not revealed. It's there and not there. So it's just like an appetizer to start and exploring uh, even more.